Good evening and welcome everyone. I'm Ruth Vanita, Professor and Director of Global Humanities and Religions and of South and Southeast Asian Studies. This presidential lecture is in collaboration with the Maureen and Mike Mansfield Center. We are thankful to President Sheila Stearns for her support, to the Mansfield Center's Director, Abraham Kim, and as always to Richard Drake for his careful hard work in organizing this visit. It's a singular delight and privilege to introduce Professor Kaushik Basu. He and I taught at Delhi University in India. There was some overlap there. And we moved to the US in the same year. I've been hoping for some years that he would come and lecture here. And I'm so happy that it worked out. Professor Basu is one of the world's great economists. He received his PhD from the London School of Economics, where he was the student of Nobel Prize winning economist Amartya Sen. He is now the C. Marx Professor of International Studies and Economics at Cornell University, and he has held visiting professorships at universities around the world. Professor Basu served as Chief Economic Advisor to the former Prime Minister of India, Manmohan Singh, who was himself an economist of note. Professor Basu has also served as Chief Economist and Senior Vice President at the World Bank. He is a recipient of the Padma Bhushan one of India's highest civilian honors. Professor Basu is the author of numerous books and scholarly papers. I'm not going to read the whole list. Equally important, he is a public intellectual who, as the poet Tennyson put it, wears his learning lightly like a flower. He is able to translate abstruse economic concepts into language that the public can understand. And he also connects economic debates to other social and political issues. For instance, I know nothing about economics, but I have been reading Professor Basu's articles in the Indian National Press for years and have profited greatly by them. Most recently, I read his article in the New York Times on India's demonetization. And as usual, it was sensible, enlightening, and not ideologically extreme in either direction. As you know, the President's lecture series has been open to the general public at no cost for 30 years now. Due to increasing costs associated with the President's Lecture Series, if you would like to make a donation to the series, there are payment information cards in the lobby. You can also make a donation online at the UM website under the President's Lecture Series. Thank you for your consideration. Please welcome Professor Basu. Thank you. Uh, generous introduction like this always puts a bit of a, a burden of responsibility to live up to that. Thank you very much, Ruth, uh, for that. And it's indeed for me a great pleasure to be here in this very beautiful part of the country, uh, meeting up with both Ruth and Mona after many years. And uh, thank you very much uh, to the president of the university for inviting me to this lecture. And I have to say that I've over the last couple of weeks, I've corresponded a lot with Richard Drake, whom I did not know earlier, but it's been a pleasure getting to know him today. Uh, thank you very much uh, um, for organizing this. Um, it does feel a bit strange. I'm going to talk to you on a very um, academic uh, topic. Um, mainstream economics, criticizing mainstream economics, but really rooted in mainstream economics. Um, I just finished my stint at the World Bank and before that in uh, the Indian government. So my last seven years have been really engagement with immediate policy challenges, rushing to something that has happened somewhere, you have to attend to that. Uh, but I decided that having returned to academe after seven years, I'll use the first seven months to sort of get back properly into the academic mode. And so this invitation has come in the middle of that seven month period of transition. So you will have to uh, bear with me hobbling back into my academic life. I do want to give over here a lecture, uh, picking up on ideas. I've done a little bit of that this afternoon, but again, 
Um, ideas that I uh, actively worked on once. Uh, given my global experience, I want to get back to some of these topics and begin to formalize the way economists typically do. Uh, but these are sort of open general questions I would like to raise and hear your views on this. I have to say it does feel a bit artificial in a world which is so troubled today, uh, politically, around the world, uh, it's troubled, uh, where uh, the narrow boundaries of identities are becoming stronger. To talk on abstruse economic ideas seems uh, a, a bit of an escapism from the current challenges. <laughs> the only way I justify this is uh, by the argument that, yes, you have to fight fires, but if you fight fires all the time and don't spend any time trying to discover non-flammable material, you'll have more fires to fight in the long run. <laughs> and the university is the place uh, to think in terms of deeper challenges, challenges which will come our way. And it's in that spirit I am going to talk about relatively abstract matters while acknowledging that we are in, indeed in a very, very challenging moment in the world. And I hope that this will pass, that a larger world of global identity and such things will begin to flourish. The um, paper is a, 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 a longish paper because my plan is to delve into many different things, but don't uh, begin to get alarmed. Uh, there is a time limit, and I will give you uh, uh, just some glimpses of the challenge of strategic thinking and ration, rational thought in strategic domains. Uh, uh, speaking of uh, endlessly long uh, things, I'm uh, remembering Philip Larkin, the poet, saying that when it comes to other people's poetry, he prefers to read them rather than have the poetry read because by reading them, he knows how far he is from the end. <laughs> so, uh, so you don't have to worry. There's a time limit. And so uh, while I'm going to get into lots of topics, it's uh, with that uh, keeping in mind. So I'm entering into the domain of rational choice, which is the heart of economics. Economics has overdone it. Uh, its obsession is with precision. Uh, we like to do things by putting it down formally, structure, uh, and occasionally give it even mathematical shape. Uh, there are times when the precision takes over and uh, the relevant material gets ignored, but it is in that mold that I'm discussing. And I will put on the table first some notions of rationality that we use in economics and then go into what I'm calling rationality in strategic domains, and I will explain that in a moment. And that opens up questions into a heart of matters, which where economics goes very weak, it is like the role of psychology in human decision making. Should we leave everything to the free market, or is there room for community decisions, state level decisions, uh, various group level decisions, collective decisions? these questions begin to come up as soon as you go into rationality and strategic thinking. And I'll end up by describing to you a game that I had developed some years ago, published it in the American Economic Review. Uh, I want to return to this game because there has been a lot of subsequent work on this game. The game is called The Traveler's Dilemma, which illustrates many of these challenges that I will talk about, and I will end with that. That's the agenda for now. When it comes to uh, rationality, there are two different kinds of notions. One is rationality as utility maximization. In very mainstream economics, the utility is completely selfish utility. So you get utility from what you eat, what you wear, how many vacations you go on. It's your own consumption. It gives you utility, and you maximize that. I will have a thing or two to say about this selfishness assumption. Uh, at the core of a lot of traditional neoclassical economics, a lot of economics has moved away from that uh, today. But that's going to be there in the background, uh, the utility maximization or payoff maximization, as game theorists say, but these are terms that I will clarify in a moment. The one which also occupies a lot of space is rationality as consistency, consistent behavior. Uh, starting with Paul Samuelson's work and a few papers before that, that's also a very important part of economic rationality assumption. 
It has been criticized with, by lots of people, and I will give you one critique, but that, then I'm going to move the, uh, that assumption aside. The uh, consistency definition goes like this. If a person prefers x to y, then that person will consistently do so. So if you've expressed a preference for x over y, whether or not a third alternative is available, z, should not change your preference between x and y. This is often called the independence of irrelevant alternatives. A third alternative should not change. If you prefer x to y, whether or not you had the option of yet another thing, that should not change between x and y, your preference. Amartya Sen criticizes this and uh, with an example, and I will give you a little bit of that because it is in, uh, on rationality I'm talking, though this, I won't spend too much time on this particular one. It is showing up, let me just see. Um, Okay, it's showing up on my small table, but it's not showing up over there, I can see. But since it is just two lines, no damage done, I will tell you what it says. You have, in fact, I can tell you the whole story uh, without the PowerPoint. It's Amartya Sen's uh, critique of uh, consistency, saying it's not very reasonable, economist's obsession with consistency. And the example is this. You've gone to the cinema. Uh, you're stepping out when someone you've never met is chatting with you on the way out about the movie, you talk, you chat, you are coming out, and when that person stops and says, listen, would you like to come home with me and have a cup of tea? Option X. Yeah. Not that it's necessary at all, but if I could get this page to show up over there. Gosh, it's one click, okay. <laughs> Embarrassing, but, yeah. but given that I've done it, I'll probably do it again uh, when I move on to other pages. So. So option X, would you come home with me and have a cup of tea? Or option Y, would you rather go back to your own home? And suppose that between these two, you choose X over Y. You say, no, I'll come with you and have a cup of tea. Now Sen wants to give an example where bringing in a third option, so you have to choose one of them, changes your preference between X and Y. So consider a scenario where you've been to the cinema, you're walking out exactly the same everything. With a person catches up with you, you begin to chat, and the person says, listen, it's nice talking. Would you like to come home with me and have a cup of tea, option X? Or would you like to rather go home, option Y? Or for that matter, there's a third option. Instead of X and Y, throws in a third option. You could also come to my home and snort some cocaine with me. At which point you may say that, you know, I'd rather go home. <laughs> Your op choice between X and Y trips over by the appearance of an another alternative. So the consistency goes, but Sen argues that lots of reasonable people may make exactly that choice, and that should not be taken as a sign of irrationality. Put that aside, I'm go this is a critique, but I'm going to, I've got other critiques to make, and that's what I'm going to be with um, uh, most of this evening. Strategic rationality, what is it? Strategic rationality, as opposed to just one-person rationality, is the following. Non-strategic rational choice is usually rational choice vis-a-vis -vis nature. So it might rain tomorrow morning or it might not rain, and I'm wondering whether to carry an umbrella or not. I do my calculations that if it rains, of course, I want to be with an umbrella, but carrying an umbrella is costly, it's painful having it in hand. I look at the probability of rain, the pain of carrying an umbrella, I take a decision. That's a rational decision in a non-strategic environment. Whereas strategic rationality is taking a rational decision in a domain where there is someone else involved who's also thinking, and maybe trying to outcompete you or whatever the other person is doing. So it's a rational decision in a domain where there are other agents who are also thinking rationally. And you know that there's another rational person. So depending on what you do, that person will react in a certain way. And 
you know that the other person is rational and you know that the other person knows that you are rational. So that person is also thinking. In these domains, how you make decision making is a very important part of our life. If you think of the Cuban Missile Crisis, after Kennedy was told on the 15th of October in the morning in 1962 that uh, the Russians have placed missiles in Cuba with which they can hit Washington with nuclear um, uh, weapons, um, Kennedy called a meeting where a team of people started discussing what should be a rational thing to do. Over here, this decision making is not about it might rain and whether we should carry umbrellas. It's knowing that Khrushchev is sitting in Moscow, thinking of how Khrushchev will react if you react in a particular way. So you have to, in your decision making, take into account the fact that the other side is thinking, that, and the other side is thinking what you are thinking. It's these interactive rationalities which are critical in a part of a lot of the modern economics. Uh, three or four years ago, I wrote a, an economist piece for Scientific American on these kinds of strategic interactions. And Scientific American wanted me to give a simple introduction of what is strategic thinking. Uh, thinking, being aware of other people's rationality. Explain that that's the heart of game theory. It's not being rational alone, but being aware that the other side is rational. And I picked an example, which I had a story which I had heard in India and uh, gave it in Scientific American. I think it's the most apt illustration of being aware or not being aware of other people's thinking what it can do. This is a story of a hat seller who's going from one small town to another small town in India, carrying lots of hats, when in the middle of wilderness, he's feeling very tired and sleepy. He sets down all his hats and goes off to sleep. When he wakes up, all the hats are gone. Monkeys had come down from a tree and taken the hats up and they've gone up to the tree. He sees and he sees those monkeys over there. When he realizes, when he's desperate, he doesn't know what to do. That is his livelihood, hat selling. What will he do in desperation and anger? He takes off his own hat and flings it down on the ground. Monkeys, you probably know, are great imitators. So when they see this hat flinging, all of them begin to fling down their hats. So the hats are on the ground, and he goes, picks them up, and he goes home very, very happy. <laughs> Forty years have passed, and his grandson has become a hat seller. And he's going from one town to another with his hats, when in the middle of wilderness, he feels sleepy, goes off to sleep, he wakes up, and all the hats are gone. Monkeys have come down from a tree and taken the hats up to the treetop. What will he do? He's a poor person. When he suddenly remembers his grandfather's story, and he says, oh, thank goodness. He takes off his hat, flings it down on the ground, but this time, one monkey comes down, picks up this last hat, <laughs> takes it under the arm, goes up to him, gives him a slap and says, you think only you have a grandfather. <laughs> it's a trivial story, but this is the heart of modern strategic thinking. It's you don't underestimate the other side. And I have seen, if in the domain of policy making, big mistakes are taking place because of this particular problem. And one example I can give you, in India, uh, this is a very practical problem I had to contend with a lot uh, when I worked in uh, the government of India. In India, there is a big program of distributing uh, subsidized food uh, to poor people. The way it is done is the Indian government collects food, buys food, uh, not forcing anyone to sell. It puts up a price sufficiently high so that farmers, it's up to them whether they want to sell or not. The price is set sufficiently high that the government collects a lot of food, comes into the government's coffers. And then the government sells this food, the part of this food is kept for the rainy day, but the other part is sold below market price through ration shops all over India. There are about roughly 500,000 government-run stores all over India where the stores are told, this is food we are handing over to you, you will sell them below the market price, Poor people will come with their cards, identifying themselves as poor, and you have to sell them at market price. In India, we have estimates that roughly 45% of this food grain leaks out onto the market. And you can see the mistake that takes place. 
the Indian government runs this program without for a moment thinking about the rationality of the ration store owners who are themselves, many of them fairly poor. They have to sell this food below market price to the people who come. What happens is they show some rationality. They sell off part of this food grain on open markets. Very often next to this ration shop, there will be another store which is a private market, and India has a private market you're allowed to sell, but this food you're not supposed to sell. They'll divert it there, sell it at market price, and the poor households will be told that uh, there is no food. What do you do in these situations? You have to take into account the rationality of not only the people and the poor to whom you're giving food, but also the rationality of the people through whom you're trying to deliver the food. Their rationality is important as well. And these are the stories of strategic rationality where you're taking into account other people's point of view. This gives rise to some domains where psychology impinges on economics in a rather beautiful way. And I'm going to give you um, two examples of psychology, which is very difficult to pin down the way we do things in economics or in game theory with a mathematical artillery, you can't do that. But still, it is concrete. Still, there are powerful uh, notions behind this, which begins to play a role in a lot of modern economic analysis. And I want to give you an example, which I'm taking from the work of Thomas Schelling's very famous book called Strategy of Conflict. And here is the example. There are two people in the original Schelling story uh, who have been parachuted and dropped in enemy territory. So think of this as, I don't know, Vietnam War or somewhere where America has been involved. And uh, two American parachuters have been dropped roughly in the space that you're seeing. And each one of them has been given in his pocket a map of this area where the person has been parachuted down. And uh, each of them, they have landed up somewhere and they have to take a decision <laughs> about where to go and stand in order to meet with the other parachuted person. So there are two persons, Americans, who have been dropped. And it's critically important for them to meet each other. Otherwise, if they are separated, they'll be killed. So this is what a classic game theory situation, where each person has to take a decision. Where in the field will I go and stand? so that the other person is likely to be at the same place. Now, I'm going to give it a little bit of structure. Assume that if you stand in the same place, roughly the same place, you'll see each other. So don't think of distant vision that you'll stand far away and wave. So if you choose the same place to go and stand, you will meet the other person. If you don't, you'll be separated and you'll be killed. So this is the game that you are playing. In this game, as game theorists will tell you, there are lots of equilibrium spots. In fact, any place where both of them choose to go and stand, it makes reasonable for you to stand there because the other person is coming there. So in some sense, you could go anywhere and stand. If, as long as the other person comes there, that's a good decision making. In the language of game theory, that's a Nash equilibrium. But the trouble is there are so many spots that you don't quite know where you will go and stand. You've got this map in your pocket, you take it out. And now play this game yourself. There's this field. The map shows you there's a river going, there's a bridge, there's some huts. You have to go and stand somewhere, and you're hoping that the other person will go and stand at the same place. And you will meet up because that way you'll be saved. The amazing thing is that though there's nothing intrinsically necessary about this, most people choose the same spot in this. It's your choice, and there's nothing called a wrong answer. I can say I'll go and stand somewhere else because this is just psychology. Make your choice, and I'll tell you what most people do in this game. They go and stand at the bridge. A dominantly large number of people do that. We don't quite know why. And that's called a focal point. Anything that creates a bit of a focus so that you manage to zero in on that is called a focal point. And that plays a role because it can save you if you can find a focal point. There are other situations where a focal point can be very easily created. I'll give you one example of a created focal point, which to me is a delightful real life example. You know, in the olden days, meeting someone at the airport, if you've decided you're going to meet someone but not fix the exact place, 
it would be dreadful in a big airport. You go and you wonder, where will I meet my friend whom I was supposed to meet? The first place where I saw this problem being cracked was Heathrow Airport. The airport authority had a clever idea. In the middle of the airport somewhere, they put up a sign saying meeting point. That's it. You've created a focal point. If you're trying to meet your friend and wondering where should I go and stand, and there's a sign saying meeting point, it's an automatic focal point. There's nothing compelling in the logic, and you may be wrong. Your friend may think you're such a nerd, you'll be at the WH Smith bookshop <laughs> and go there. But that meeting point sign does work. People do manage to coordinate. And I'll give you one more example. This is called the squares game. Two people are playing this game, and the game is played as follows. You have to choose one of these squares, and the other person also chooses a square. If you choose the same square, you will get $100. If you choose different squares, you will get zero. This again has a problem. There's a profusion of different places. Any square that both of you choose, it's a good choice. But both of you have to choose that. In this game, it's going to be completely mismatched. Someone will choose the, most people, I've played this in classrooms, they go for the northeast corner somehow. Many people go. But there are people who will go for the southwest corner, and uh, it, it differs. I suppose a Californian will choose differently from a New Yorker, etc. That'll happen. Uh, but I can do very, something very simple. I'll say that, look, you have to choose one square, <laughs> any square. If both of you choose, you will get $100 each. But I'm doing something. I'm just calling one of them the red square. I'm just calling it. You ignore it. You don't have to do anything. Now you choose. Which square will you choose? It's like the meeting point sign in Heathrow. Both will choose the red square. A salience like that of a certain outcome helps people coordinate. We can't quite pin down what is it. Human psychology, there is something which allows that to do that. And this is an extremely important idea, I believe, in a whole lot of domains in life. And I will give you a little bit of <laughs> examples of this idea of focal point in game theory to show what it can do. I will do these very quickly because I want to spend a little bit of time on the traveler's dilemma. Uh, this is what I'm working on now, law as focal point. Here is my uh, um, ch uh, challenge with the conventional view of law and economics, and I feel the only way to understand this is to use the idea of focal point. Let me uh, try to explain this to you. Uh, economists, especially those who work in law and economics, will tell you that uh, what does uh, um, a new law do? It changes people's, it changes the game people, uh, games people are playing because it changes your payoffs or returns from different actions, the utility that you get from different actions. And the example that I'll give you is suppose you're planning to drive at 80 miles per hour to go somewhere. There's no speed limit law in the country. Uh, you will make a little bit of calculation, a quick calculation. Is it worthwhile for me to go at that uh, speed uh, or not? I might have an accident, etc. And you will, if it seems okay, you will do it. Now say there is a new law saying that you can't drive over 60 miles per hour on this road. The standard argument used to be that it changes your cost-benefit analysis now. The game has changed. Now if you go above 60 miles per hour, there are all those risks. But over and above that, there's a risk that a cop will come, pull you up, and charge you a fine. And you have to take that into account, and that's what changes your calculation and your behavior. But there is one problem with this. In the end, if you think of a law, a new law in the abstract, a new law is nothing but a little bit of ink and scribbling on paper. You write down some rules of behavior. If collectively society decides to look the other way, how can the game of economy change? The fact that there's a little bit of scribbling on paper that was done cannot change the game that we are playing. If the policeman looks the other way, you ignore the law, the magistrate ignores the law, if everyone ignores the law, you could play the game exactly the way you were playing earlier. Actually, I think this is a rather deep question, and philosophers and some economists and some legal um, theorists as well have begun to think about this. And the conclusion that people are inching towards is that a law 
though it's nothing but a few words on paper, plays the same role as that red square that I put in over there. It creates a focal point. It changes your beliefs about one another. In the end, if you all want to collectively look away from the law, you can do that. It's as if the law was not there, and I can give lots of examples from developing countries where there are laws which the police, the judge, the magistrate, the people, everybody uh, looks away from that law. But the law can create a focal point with all the uh, bewildering features of a focal point. You can't quite explain it, but what happens in America is when a new speed limit law comes, the police knows that I'm supposed to stop someone uh, for speeding. If I don't, the magistrate will probably punish me for not stopping someone, or my rating in my career will go down as a police person. The people know that the police will stop. The magistrate knows that if I don't take a step against the police who is lax on this, society will uh, uh, castigate my decision making. So it's the belief structure which changes. So a law, in the end, is nothing but like that little red square that you suddenly marked one, you uttered some words, but in societies which are already trained to treat the law as a focal point, it changes people's belief about one another. And that is an idea where you have to think of law and how it influences society by changing the focal point. And my belief is understanding why the law gets so poorly implemented. I give you the example of the food ration law in India. To understand the poor implementation of the law, it is very important to understand that in the end, the law is nothing but some ink on paper. Society can collectively look away from that. If it does not, the law is implemented. If it does, society does look away. And actually, there are examples I'm forgetting right now in a paper by George Melath, uh, Stephen Morris, and uh, Andy Postlewaite, where um, uh, they uh, point to some examples even in the US where the law is there on paper. But people collectively look away from the law. So it's possible. There's another example I want to give you where I think the focal point plays a role. This is a very troubling area. This is discrimination against groups. Uh, there is a very famous experiment that was done by uh, uh, Marian Bertrand and Sendil Mulayanathan. Uh, they did this experiment in Chicago and in Boston. Um, it's a, a paper on discrimination where they are trying to show that people have pure discriminatory preferences. So, you know, in many places when you get discrimination, say one group, a race, African Americans are being not getting a certain kind of jobs. Another group, another religion, not getting something that uh, they want to get. At times, economists have, justif have said that it's entirely possible that you're just looking at the race or the religion or uh, the language group the person belongs to, but that correlates with something else. People are not racist, it's possible, but it's the correlate that they want educated people and that correlates and that's the reason. What Sendel and Marion wanted to do was block that escape route out and they did this very clever experiment. Actual advertisements for certain jobs that had appeared in uh, newspapers in um, Chicago and Boston, they created fake applica uh, applications. So people who would have very obvious African-American names and people who would have very obvious white American names. And the CVs otherwise were very, very similar. So across race, there are all kinds of CVs, but the pool is roughly the same. And then you apply. They sent out these applications to these uh, places. And the callback was dramatically less for African Americans. So over here, your correcting degree is all fake uh, CVs. So the degree is the same, number of years of experience is the same, the previous employer's uh, uh, um, remarks on you is the same. You send out the CV, just the name, in one case is African American, in one case it's white. And they've got results like that. Uh, um, if you have an African uh, American name, you need eight years more of experience in your work to get the same amount of callback rate. So this is very often treated as this is a sign of pure discrimination. But I want to give a generous interpretation. Of course, people do discriminate, we, and we ought to do everything in our capacity to dissuade that. But it is also possible to take a generous view of this to say that, no, these people did not have 
uh, discrimination, but there is a focal point exercise going on. This is a bit of a deadly explanation because it pardons the people, but it holds the market accountable that the market left to itself can create discriminatory forces. And let me explain this to you. For many domains in life, how effective a person will be, a person whom you've employed for some task, depends on how others will relate to that person. So you've got someone to do your, uh, take care of your lawn, you are an absentee landlord, you uh, uh, live in another country, you've got someone who will buy fertilizers, do everything, look after your lawn. If this person, however, has problems with the fertilizer company, with the bank, with which this person has to uh, uh, interact with, this person won't be too productive for you. Now, if it is possible that a person becomes good at doing task X, if the person is also asked to do task Y, and the person is good at doing task Y, if the person is also has to do task X, this is called strategic complementarity in economics. It makes you more effective in one thing if you're in demand on other things, because these are complementary activities. Think of life's complementary activities. There, you want to get someone for your task to be done or your job to be done, who will also very easily be called upon by others and relate easily to others. And there's a limited number of tasks, so if you spread it thin across the population, people will be pretty inefficient at doing what they are doing. So you may have no racial bias, but you want to pick a small group who get all the tasks because they become more and more productive. You have no a priori um, uh, racial preference, but a race becomes like a focal point. You know that the others are also going for this group. Then it's worthwhile for you to go for this group because your person will be more effective in carrying out your task. So it's possible that you did not want to discriminate and in itself these things mean nothing, race and religion when you're hiring someone, but you want others also to uh, relate to this person easily and it becomes a focal point exercise where the race or the religion becomes a focal point. This is troubling in a different way, is you don't need biases, you don't need government intervention. At times, interventions do lead to uh, biases in the market. Over here, it is happening because the market is giving you a focal point and a coordination exercise is becoming possible uh, through this. So the focal point in a game can lead to a theory of discrimination which at one level pardons individuals because you're not at fault, but it holds the market guilty that the market naturally gives rise to this. I have a feeling that this is a challenge that we are going to face as we go into the future because there is now a lot of evidence over the last 40, 50 years that work worldwide is shrinking. You are getting more time for your leisure activity which philosophers had dreamed of for hundreds from Plato to more recent times. Bertrand Russell and even the uh, Indian poet, Tagore wrote about, Tagore himself hated work and wrote about a time when there would be very little work for people to do as a sort of ideal society. We are heading towards that. But when there is a little pool of work to be done, do we spread it thin across the entire population and have people doing it inefficiently? Do we pool it to a small group of people taking over the entire work? and others are starving in that case, what do you do? I feel this is a big challenge that we have to face. It's another topic. It is to do with income distribution, wealth tax, and such matters, which we will have to think of. But the focal point draws attention to the fact that as work shrinks, you will have to face a choice. Do you spread it thin across the population where people will be inefficient? Or because of complementarities of work, some people are like a, a, a section of bees that they do the hard work and others don't, but in that case, you'll have to think of income transfer mechanisms, where people who are left to pursue philosophy and fishing are also able to eat and wear clothes because they have money power to buy, is a challenge that we have to face up to. I want to move, maybe a bit abruptly, to a bit of a discussion of the traveler's dilemma, which is a story, almost a parable, written up, um, uh, Ruth, uh, I hope you're watching, uh, Another 15 minutes, is, is that okay? Yeah, so that will be fine. This is a small game that I created with sort of pools in lots of things. It, it's a critique of economics. It's a critique of rationality. 
and very open-ended. And there has, uh, I wrote up the game as a paper, published it in American Economic Review. It's a short little paper, but it has now received a lot of attention. Last seven years, I did not manage to pay attention to the work that was happening on this game, but I'm now coming, reading and catching up. But the game lies at the pivot of all the problems of strategic thinking. I had constructed the game deliberately so that it will heighten some of the human, big human dilemmas. So let me tell you the game. The game is very easy. You don't need any game theory to understand. Two persons, travelers, it's called the traveler's dilemma. You and another traveler went to some exotic island in the Pacific, Western Samoa. You don't know the other person. You went there. Both of you bought some exotic little uh, toy or sculpture in that island. You've come back, you've just flown in to uh, San Francisco, you've got down, you've, both of you collect your baggage and you find that this thing that you bought in Western Samoa, the airline has damaged it. They handled it very badly. Now, you want compensation. You go pick up, kick up a fuss, say, you know, it's a once in a lifetime trip and you've clearly handled it badly. Both of you are arguing, you have to compensate us. And the airline comes and says, we are very happy to compensate you, but there's a problem. It's such a strange object that both of you have bought, they've bought the same kind of thing, that we have no idea what the price is. So here is the way I'm going to compensate you. Two of you sit down at different places in the airport with a piece of paper, write down on that paper the price of this object. Basically, you write down any digit number from two to 100. So each one of you write an integer in there. And then once you've given me, this is the way I'm going to compensate you. This is, I'm treating this as the price of the object. If both of you have written the same, I treat that, that well, I know what the price is. If both of you have written 54, 54 must be the price. And I'll give you that sum. Each of you will get $54. But if you've written different uh, integers, then I will assume that the person who's given the lower number is telling the truth. That is the price of the object. The person giving the higher number is trying to make some money out of the airline. So I'm going to compensate you in the following manner. Give you the lower number of the two numbers, but with a little bit of reward and punishment. The person who's written the lower number will get plus $2. The person who's written the higher num number will get minus $2. Do you get this? So this is the game. Now don't ask me about the rationality and the sense of the airline company. They've done this. You are sitting here, you have to now write down a number on this piece of paper, put yourself in the shoes, and just, I'm now clarifying. So if both of you write 92, you will both get $92 each. If one writes 90 and the other writes 92, the person who wrote, no, let me take a different number. If one writes 92 and the other writes 95, the one who wrote 92 will get 94. Lower number, plus $2 as reward for relative honesty. The person who wrote 95 will get 92 minus 2, so 90. Is this clear? That's the game. Now, when you get this game, forget about the uh, price of this object. Say it was $5. So they've got a very good bargain coming from the airline that they're going to make some money. And also, don't make them moral creatures. There's no room for that in this game. They are ruthless to individuals who want to make money as much as possible. What would you do? And at first sight, you may feel that, well, it's very good. We are both clearly, you're looking at the other person. We are both going to write $100, and we'll make $100 on this. And you're feeling very pleased. But if you're a ruthless, selfish maximizer, when you're about to write down 100 on the piece of paper in the belief that the other person is writing 100, something should strike you. And what is that? That you can do a little better by writing 99. Because then yours will be the lower number, you'll get a compensation of two, you'll get 101. You know, one extra dollar, why not ditch that fellow? Uh, if, I mean, take yourself now, keep it in a completely ruthless world. So you will, when you're about to write down 100, you'll say, no, I'll write 99 and I'll get 101. But by then it should strike you that that fellow looks clever enough. And by now that person has reached the same conclusion and that person is about to write 99. Well, what should you do? Well, it should strike you, you should write 98. <laughs> that way you'll be back again at 100, 98 plus two. So thank goodness I can get back 100, I'll write 98 when it strikes you. By now the other fellow has reached that conclusion. That person is about to write 98. So what should I do? The rational response is 97. 
By this, it's called backward induction. In this game, the only rational thing for you to do is to write two. And the other person also should write two, and you will get $2 each. This, if you think very hard, and the following is the assumption we are making that both are rational. They know that the other is rational, and they know that the other person knows that you're rational. So you're making these assumptions. With these assumptions, the traveler's dilemma takes you to a prediction where two rational agents will write two and do miserably badly. They will get $2 each, and they will go home. <laughs> the traveler's uh, dilemma is also cooked up. I mean, it's a game that I cooked up. It fits in with regular game. In game theory, there are lots of different ration, notions of rationality and equilibrium. There's Nash equilibrium, there is strict equilibrium, there's rationalizable equilibrium. But in the traveler's dilemma, no matter which definitions you use of game theory, all will predict two is what people will write and two is what they will get. Now, there are two objections to this. Uh, one is that there have been now lots of laboratory tests on the traveler's dilemma. People don't write two. They write, usually you get num digits in 90s. 95, 96, 97, 98, 100, that's where people are. You get a few people writing two, and my belief is they are trying to tell you that I've learned game theory, that's all. It's, it's not that honest choice that they are making when they write two. But to me, more than the lab experiments, the trouble is, I think it's raising a question about the meaning of rationality. At one level, even if I'm playing a super intelligent person, there, and we both know we are ruthless, we want to make money, we are mean characters, still I will write something very high, and I know that person is going to write something very high. It somehow makes sense. Very high, which number you can never agree on, because as soon as you agree on a number, you should undercut it by one. And then you are again down on that spiral. But there has to be some notion of rationality that takes you to a higher number, which has to be a fuzzy notion of rationality. You can't quite pin down what that definition is. So there is a small literature on vagueness in uh, logic, on fuzzy mathematics. There is a fuzzy mathematics, but still it's very, very difficult to explain why people choose this kind of a thing. There is recent work done by uh, the computer scientist uh, Joe Halpern and uh, Raphael Pass which is regret minimization. That people are not just maximizers of utility, they want to make choices where they want to minimize the regret at the end of the choice that they make. Uh, once you f write down the definition of regret minimization nicely and in a very intuitive way, I will not inflict in a post-dinner uh, lecture by giving you details of that, if you have both individuals being regret minimizers, the rational choice is either 96, 97, 98, 99, or 100. It's very interesting that regret minimization takes you to that cluster where actually most people do end up over there. And this has critiques, this has criticism. This is a paper that came out in Games and Economic Behavior in 2011, the regret minimization. But I feel this is something that needs greater attention to what is it that human beings are aspiring and trying to do. But throughout, I've been arguing, keeping saying that individuals are ruthless, selfish maximizers. The other thing that had, has to be kept in mind, that human beings are, of course, not that. People do think of the others. When I'm sitting in an airline, um, at an airport, there's another person. I will not think of ditching that person to get one extra dollar <laughs> ditch and go a dollar lower. I will say, OK, we've traveled together from the same place. Let's both go for 100. And presumably, that person has that. This paper, since in the empirical uh, studies, you get invariably people choosing high numbers, I think mainly it is pointing to the fact that human beings have altruism. They have implicit contracts. A person I may not even know, but I respect that person, and I have an implicit contract with this uh, person. And I feel economics has given too little space for these kinds of human traits and given too little importance to that. It's understandable how this happened because the most surprising result in economics was what Adam Smith discovered in 1776. The fact that selfishness can also lead to organization, order, and society is in, indeed a stunning discovery. 
and Adam Smith was right in giving it some importance. But we are wrong in giving it more importance than even Adam Smith gave. And the proof of that is when Adam Smith published his Wealth of Nations in 1776, the invisible hand, which is supposed to coordinate selfish individuals and give social optimality, which Adam Smith created the concept. Adam Smith couldn't have realized that in the future, people will forget everything else in his mammoth book and remember only the invisible hand. And the hard proof of that is in the index to that book which Adam Smith prepared. Invisible hand does not appear in it. So Smith did not realize that that's going to be the most important part of the book for future generations. Smith talked about empathy, talked about kindness, talked about compassion, that these things are important. And what has to be understood is that there is indeed something quite stunning that selfishness can also lead to coordination. But you do need those other traits for a society to do well and not, not, not get caught in that two-two equilibrium of the traveler's dilemma. Those traits play a role. And we have to nurture those traits and help those traits. And now, fortunately, with game theory, there's a whole lot of results of that kind coming into existence. I'll, I'll just give one or two examples, two or three minutes, and then I'll stop because I do want to take in some questions. <coughs> Selfishness, drive, those things play a role. People work hard, struggle to do things. But altruism, compassion, integrity, these are also the nuts and bolts of an economy. And actually, there are examples galore, and it'll be completely wrong to overlook them. Trust among strangers is extremely important for an economy to function. Every time you do a transaction, it's impossible to write down a contract and have it legally uh, uh, verified and then wait for the courts to ensure that the contract will be fulfilled. When I take a 30-year loan from a bank, it can't be a word of mouth understanding. Of course, there will be a written contract. But think of the number of domains in life where we transact, where actually there's a gap between my doing my side of the job and you're doing your side of your job. One of the best examples, and this is one of my earliest papers written in an Indian journal called Economic and Political Weekly. It's the shortest paper I've written, and it's my paper with the longest title. The title is, Why Do We Not Try to Walk Away Without Paying After a Taxi Ride? And the question I asked for the following reason, that every time you do a taxi ride, one side of the deal is done first. The taxi driver delivers on his or her part of the deal, and then you have to pay. And it's possible to run away. I know this from some college friends in Delhi who did run away after a taxi ride. It's possible to run away in a big city and never be caught again, and you can get away. But most of us don't think of that. You know, if you ask economists, I think it's changing. When I was writing that paper, I asked lots of economists, why don't people run away after a taxi ride without paying? And the reason would be given trying to fit reality to the model that you are already hooked into. So economists would give reasons like, look, if you try to run away, there's a 10% chance the taxi driver will come after you, grab you, and give you a thrashing. That is so painful that you'd rather pay up. So you're paying up purely because of selfish, rational reasons. To me, that would be extremely alarming. I think that's completely wrong. If every time you're in a crowded room, if you feel people are not pinching your pocket by doing calculations about the costs and benefits of getting caught by stealing your wallet, it would be a very alarming society to live in. Most people are programmed that you just don't steal other people's wallets. You don't run away after a taxi ride. You pay after the taxi ride. This programming, whereby it's a little bit of integrity in life, plays a critical role in a whole host of economic functions. And there are certain kinds of transactions which in certain societies don't actually take place because there's no way of having the law come in and every time after a taxi ride, you can't go to a court and say that, look, this uh, uh, transaction has been done and let the magistrate rule. There are lots of transactions that would cease to take place in society if there wasn't personal integrity. Integrity, compassion, these traits play a very, very important role in enabling a market to function. I'm not saying these are good traits in themselves, we should try to nurture them, but even if they, were, they are not, they are the nuts and bolts of a market economy. Fortunately, when you 
have games and make people play games, you do get the optimal outcome. In the traveler's dilemma, ruthless rationality takes you to a dreadful outcome, but you do get people to go to a good outcome because these traits are already there. But these traits can be nurtured and heightened or can be lessened and diminished. And the biggest example that these uh, traits can be diminished is uh, this uh, rather celebrated paper by my Cornell colleagues. It's a group of economists and psychologists. Uh, Bob Frank is one of the authors. Tom Gilovich is one of the authors. There are two, three others. They created these games in the laboratory where you can play the games more selfishly or less selfishly, uh, different ways of playing the game. And they took in students of psychology, of mathematics, physics, economists, in different groups, in labs, and made them play these games. The economists came out the most selfish players they, in, in the lab. They were playing the games very selfishly. I take a relatively generous view that it's not that selfish people are attracted to the discipline of economics, but if you've done economics and you're reading textbook after textbook, that ruthless selfish, selfishness is the trait that human beings have, and this is what allows societies and markets to flourish. Most of us are conformists to a certain extent and you want to behave the way it is normal behavior. And I believe that the reason why economists come out distinctly more selfish than others is you've learned through textbooks that that's the way the human beings are. So these traits can be nurtured up or nurtured down, but we do need to nurture them up, and as I said, not just as a good end in, them, uh, in itself, but because these are critical ingredients for a market to function well, for an economy to do well. There are laboratory tests on this, there are these large sweeping studies like Francis Fukuyama showing that societies where there is greater trust are societies which actually do better economically, they function better. They can do more transactions, more trade, so these are things to be nurtured. So this is a little bit of mainstream game theory to be brought into neoclassical economics to broaden the agenda of economics which is worthwhile and I do hope to spend, now that I'm back in academics, a little bit of time pushing for this kind of an agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Basu, for that illuminating lecture. Professor Basu will now take questions from the audience. I was asked to read this request. Please make your questions short and respectful. Questions should be asked in a spirit of inquiry and not be editorials. To ask a question, please go to the microphones in the aisles and introduce yourself. If you cannot access the standing microphones, we have handheld microphones, so please ask the attendant for one. Thank you. All fine. I'm just willing to overrule one part of what Ruth said. The respectfulness part you can overrule. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Abhishek. Um, um, Abhishek Chatterjee, I'm in the political science department. So for, an, uh, for a sociologist, it wouldn't be very surprising what you said. Emile Durkheim pointed out in the 19th century that there's a double contract underlying the first contract that you always honor contracts, otherwise no contracts would be honored. Um, so how would you bring this meta contract into uh, game theory? And the second part is, you know, you, your question is, I'm working on this too. My next project is on why people obey rules. And um, I was wondering if you'd read any of John Searle's work in, in, in philosophy. Uh, he has a conception of, um, he, he has a conception on um, uh, uh, speech acts where rationality is not a given by your uh, uh, sort of the uh, objectives and the options you have, but uh, there's a gap between the two. So when you promise somebody, I promise you I will do this, you create an extra reason for action, which is not given by your pre-existing rationality itself. I was wondering if you've considered yeah. John Searle's speech acts as yeah. fitting into this kind of framework. Thank you very much, Abhishek. So um, um, here's the way I look at it. Yes, it's true that in sociology, this awareness has been there for a long time. It's an awareness that's there even in psychology, in other disciplines. And I feel economists also, when they take off their economist's hat, at one level they are aware of this. It's just that the discipline, when you're writing down your papers, the theorems, etc., you push those assumptions aside. What I think has gone wrong in economics is at times it's fine to say that there are certain parts of reality, like human, honesty, integrity, which I'm unable to model and analyze, so I'm going to push it aside and do the things that I can talk about. 
but what economists have, having done that, you get programmed and begin to forget, forget that those things exist. And I think that's the main problem with, uh, with economics is that you forget that those qualities were important. You left them aside because given your tools of analysis, you can't do that very well. What game theory is in fact allowing us to do is to bring in uh, that agenda, which was with Durkheim, which is also later on you'll see uh, Karl Polanyi, more recently uh, um, uh, Granovetter, talking about the embeddedness of economics in the other disciplines. You begin to bring these in, into uh, uh, our modeling. I feel game theory, a lot of it is very abstruse, uh, endless amount of mathematical analysis, but a lot of it is, which is coming down from the, say, the Thomas Schelling uh, school, is just reason thinking about these matters, allowing us to bring in the kind of precision that a lot of economics does use. So if today by using game theory we can go back to some of those topics and give them shape to what Durkheim was talking about, David Hume, I can extensively quote David Hume because Hume is of great interest to me, talks about uh, uh, the power of human beliefs and it's very close to focal point just that he didn't have game theory uh, uh, to draw on. So we would be able to make use of this. And when it comes to John Searle, I've read a little bit of John Searle. Once upon a time, speech acts used to be of great interest to me. I also read a, uh, no, heard a debate between John Searle and Gayatri Spivak. It's the most <laughs> abstruse uh, discussion that you can think of. John Searle is very important to us for one reason with game theory. Speech acts, and in game theory now there is a literature called cheap talk. Uh, and it also the ink on paper theory that I was talking about. Uh, uh, there is this school that says that the fact that you have a conversation before you play a game, in old fashioned game theory that would do nothing. You uttered a few words and then you go and play a game. Now there is a small school that looks into this, that once you say things, that influences how you're going to play the game after that. So the speech begins to influence your behavior. And so these are all important topics which have been there outside. One thing that I do think is a strength of economics. One is the notion of equilibrium. I think it's a big contribution of economics, which the other social sciences don't use enough of that. With the notion of equilibrium, some of the formalisms of game theory, if we can revisit those topics which were much more present in the other social sciences, we'll have a much richer economics. Hello, hi, my name is Anisa Keith, I'm an undergraduate here. Um, I heard you talk about in your seminar earlier today that the work pool is shrinking and that you feel that it's going towards wage sharing. Um, that doesn't seem to work in today's like economic setup and I was wondering how you can reconcile that. Yeah, so um, I was not saying that it's going towards wage sharing, but I'm saying it should, uh, sorry, uh, profit sharing but it should go to a little bit of that. Let me explain because this is, she's picking up on my earlier lecture. The, uh, what is happening, and this is undisputed, I mean, you will get data from all around, uh, is the share of the national income which accrues as wages, so the total wage bill as a proportion of GDP in all advanced economies is falling from about 1972, 73, the data I've seen up to now, falling steadily and pretty sharp. This can't go on for too long because there's a whole section of the population that lives off their labor. So if this trend continues, there's going to be devastation. And I think some of the political turmoil that you're seeing across the world actually has to do with the fact that the wage share is uh, literally collapsing in the advanced economies and not just advanced economies, also the middle income economies. The Middle East and all, it's in the very poor economies, developing countries that it's not yet happening. But rest, it's falling. This trend, I feel if it continues, it's going to destabilize the world. What do you do about this? I believe personally that a certain amount of profit sharing has to be taken seriously. This is something that people, philosophers have uh, talked about this. Economist Marty Weitzman at MIT some 20 years ago wrote about this. Uh, Bob Hockett, who's a, a lawyer at Cornell, has written about this. People have begun to write about some amount of profit sharing. I think you have to think of this, and you have to do this carefully. I'm not saying that you take away the profit incentive for everyone. The markets need to function. You do need private enterprise and enthusiasm for that. But if a society says that 10% of the profit, entire profit being earned in society, is going to be distributed to the workers, then every time a set of robots come and displace 100 workers, and this is happening just across the board, the 
wages earned, the workers will not immediately feel that I'm completely down and out in the streets. The increased profit that this is going to create, a part of this is going to come back to these workers. Um, manufacturing in the United States is a very good example. It's not dead, but the way it is going is, it's labor is becoming negligible. So even where manufacturing is flourishing, its machine intensity has just gone up because labor is too expensive. You have to think of other kinds of interventions, which is largely to do with some form of profit share, some part of profits being shared with the workers as a collective is what I think we have to think of seriously. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor, for your thoughts. Mark Wilson, and not to step away from academia, and you may have already segued with your last thought onto my question, but I was wondering if you could uh, share a quick story when you served at the World Bank as to some of the biggest challenges you've maybe faced in the past, or maybe you were just alluding to some of the current challenges that the World Bank currently faces. If you could just share a story from your time serving there. Yeah. I'm pulling you away from academia here. But. Yes, yes, <laughs> but I, the, the, there are, um, I, I can think of actually uh, easy and big challenges. I'll, I'll give you occasionally a little bit of thought can lead you to a solution, but there are also disappointments. Let me give you two examples. You're asking for one. In um, um, Western Samoa, the reason why the island uh, plays in my head is uh, the tsunami hit Western Samoa. And when the tsunami, the famous tsunami hit, people just died along the strip of the sea. And that area is the following. You have the sea on one side, narrow strip of land, and mountains going up, just straight taking off. All you need, nowadays a tsunami, you'll get a couple of hours for sure to be able to tell people that the tsunami is coming. Just some roads which are going up to the hill. So three hours before the tsunami hits, you begin to announce the tsunami is likely to come. Please run up these tracks. So this, after this struck, the World Bank worked with the government over there. While I was there, work was going on. Simply roads were being built up. And the roads will remain over there for people to run up should the need arise. It's a very focused kind of problem. And it's just, just a question of striking that you don't have to change their lifestyles totally, but you can do that. So there are some examples of that. The bigger ones, the bigger challenge, actually, the one where I feel also I've been too late waking up to this, is the environment. The World Bank is now fully um, aware of the challenges of the um, deteriorating environment, climate change, and that you have to do something about it. But what do you do? How quickly do you come into this? Uh, for me, the, it is not that I thought that climate change is not taking place, environment is not important, but it was a very dormant part of my, I'm, as a citizen I'm aware, but as an economist I spent no time. But it's in recent times, traveling to developing countries, and most importantly to Delhi and Beijing, China and India, where you don't have to read books, you have to look up at the sky, and you can see the damage that is being done. The World Bank is coming into this now in a big way. But here, it's the first steps being taken, and there are some big challenges. You can't act foolishly by saying that you immediately stop a whole host of activities, you'll cause starvation and death. So you have to see how you come in on this measured steps and all. It's a big challenge, and the challenge is going to live with us no easy solution. I'm actually going back to another example, which took me into public policy early in life, 1994 in the United States. There was a discussion of something called the Harkins Bill to ban any product which had a child labor input. I wrote a New York Times op-ed saying that you can't suddenly act and put an, stop child labor. Child labor is a dreadful thing, it ought to go. But child labor occurs in households where the parents are devastatingly poor. A sudden stoppage of child labor will end child labor, but will cause child starvation to shoot up. You have to think of other interventions side by side when you are going in with this intervention. So again, certain things which look knee-jerk correct can be complex, and environment is one such challenge with the World Bank is now very deeply in it, but it's not always clear what, what is the right thing to do. Uh, thanks for sharing your thoughts tonight. My name is Eamon Ormseth, and my, my question is two-part. Um, well, some context is that there's a drive among um, fast food workers to get a $15 minimum wage right now. And what happens in response is the retail or the, the Fast Food Association of America, I don't, I don't know the name, a trade group takes out ads in, the, in major newspapers and says, look, if, if you raise the minimum wage, uh, we're going to have to cut workers. And 
in Econ 101, this, this sort of minimum wage problem is presented very simply. If you raise the wage, it creates a dead weight loss, et cetera, et cetera. There's going to be less people working for more money. But as, as it seems like as you get into the macro economy that uh, economists really disagree on this. Um, so my first part is w what do you think about a minimum wage as a way of um, redistributing profit as, as you're mentioning, talking about the, the issue of automation. And the second part is, what ways do you think the field of economics, and specifically neoclassical economics, in using simple supply and demand models in a facile way in these newspaper ads serves as a focal point for industries like um, fast food industries to justify um, not raising the wages of their workers when it's well known that, I mean, a great example is that McDonald's was suggesting its employees apply for welfare at the same time as they're hiring them. Is, is the question clear? Uh, the second part is not clear. So, so it, it, the field of economics can serve as a, a focal point in a way, like, like a certain law, in such a way that it allows certain industries to justify cutting jobs, even when yeah, I, cutting jobs in such a way is maybe undermining the social contract? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, so the first one on uh, minimum wage, um, the standard economics argument, I'll tell you, uh, uh, in a com if labor markets were completely competitive, then if you uh, uh, raise minimum wage, you will manage to raise minimum wages, but you'll create unemployment. So every rise in uh, minimum wage is going to throw some people out. But if labor markets are not completely competitive, if there is a certain amount of um, uh, oligopoly or oligopsony in the labor markets, that is, need not be true. You can raise minimum wage and still not lose jobs. I've got a paper with Joe Stiglitz, uh, me, Joe Stiglitz, and Garons Genico, which looks at exactly this, where you can raise some minimum wages and jobs won't be lost. Having said that, um, so a certain amount is possible, but I am a bit worried about what occasionally activists will argue for is raising it very high. I feel if you raise it too high, you will begin to lose jobs. And there the trade-off becomes that the people who get jobs are well off because you have raised the minimum wage, but there'll be a whole chunk of people who are out of jobs. That's the reason why I do hesitate on, I don't quite know which number where I stop, I have to look much more carefully, but I don't go along with people who would just say that you raise the minimum wages and you'll take care of the problem. Well, you'll take care of the problem of some workers who will get jobs at those minimum wages. You will create a huge problem for a whole lot of workers who now, in fact, won't get a job because of that. So I feel, in the end, some form of profit sharing, where, again, you don't take away the entire profit market and do that, you'll destroy incentives. But 10%, 20%, leave the rest to usual profit, and then you transfer that and not tamper too much with market indicators is the way I would go. Economics being used as a focal point, I'm sure that happens. I mean, the arguments that we are putting forward, maybe the way these students, um, uh, economic students played in the lab that I talked about differently from the sociology students and the math students is to do with the subject has influenced some of their thinking. So it is a focal point kind of influence, which is indeed very, very possible. There's someone coming over there. Thank you very much for the wonderful lecture. Uh, my name is David. I'm from India. Um, I'm happy that an economist is talking about uh, market with integrity and uh, like the human side of uh, all these money business. But uh, in the recent past, uh, in 2014 in India, in 16 in, in the US with Brexit, we have seen that all the markets react positively when nationalist right-wing governments are elected. Why does this happen? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one, there is a little bit of evidence that the market overreacts positively in the beginning and then goes down after that. There's some evidence of that. Oh, uh, um, the clearest one, which I know, I, I know the data, is Indira Gandhi, when she declared emergency, which is a, a kind of dictatorial control in India in 1975, 
1975-76 that year, India has the, had the fastest growth till then in its history. Trains were running on time, the economy suddenly picked up, but two years down the road, the economy began tanking. So you do get a bit of a flush of first thing. The other thing is, even if the economy does well, very often it does well because a small group feels that it's almost a crony capture of the politics of the country. And if those people are more prominent in the stock markets and a variety of exchange rate trading, then you will get a positive flush taking place in these. I would then say even if that leads to greater growth, if you dissect that growth, you are probably getting a greater growth in the economy with increasing inequality, people being deprived. So yes, that may happen, but I would not celebrate on that because for me, GDP is not the only thing by which you're judging an economy. Yeah. And on this uh, thing about uh, um, these qualities, integrity and other good qualities, there's one, um, uh, again, a bit of a game theoretic problem. Just having a section of the population, having these qualities is not good enough. If it's not a collectively held view, then you'll tend to get exploited by others who will come and take advantage of you, of the group that is being completely honest and direct, others may begin to take advantage. So there is a bit of a collective action problem, the reason why it's hard to get into these better equilibria. Thanks again for the talk, and I enjoyed your talk this afternoon. Brad Layton with Energy Technology. So, Thanks for the uh, examples with the two-player game theory. Have you done anything with multiplayer? So for example, one thing I've thought about is uh, where you have two uh, societies with the government and the democracy where the government may not agree with the democratic majority on both sides. And um, just wanted to ask your opinion as to the rationality of you know where our current administration is going versus our democratic majority and how a larger democratic majority may uh, act in a more rational manner to um, overcome what may be perceived as an irrational um, government. Yeah, I, well, I have to say that I don't have a uh, um, uh, good enough answer for this. But first of all, on game theory, there's a huge amount of game theory, which is n-person games. So I've, I'm giving two-person games for simplicity. Game theory is today as an in-person discipline. And another thing is game theory is now theory of games being played over time. So there are things you're, that you're doing now and then coming back after two periods to doing something else. So it's a very rich body that can take on. What you're talking about really is not so much game theory as what we call voting analysis and social choice theory of democratic, uh, of people's preferences and how they translate into collective decision making. There, the big guru of that, the person who actually single-handedly started the discipline is now 94 years old, Kenneth Arrow at Stanford. And among very prominent names, uh, Amartya Sen uh, uh, on voting and democracy. And one example is Amartya Sen and Eric Maskin have a paper in the New York Review of Books, the uh, last but one issue, on very similar questions being asked that when a democratic decision making is uh, taking place in a country, does it lead to increased welfare or not? And the answers are, it, it, this is not really game theory, but it is social choice theory. Very, you get usually very negative answers on the kinds of things that you get out of these democratic decision makings. The most famous of the negative uh, answers is Kenneth Arrows. Kenneth Arrow's uh, work which shot into prominence and really created this discipline. I keep treating that as the biggest single theorem in economics. Arrow wrote down five what are called virtually moral axioms that you want society to satisfy. Any reasonable democracy should satisfy five things. I'll give you an example of one of them. One of them is if everybody prefers candidate X to Y, society should choose X over Y. Seems unexceptional. Almost like that, he writes down five conditions, and then he comes up with this theorem called the impossibility theorem, that there is no democratic voting system which will satisfy all these five moral uh, precepts. So you will have to give up on one of these. And if you read these five, it's painful to contend with the fact that one of them you have to give up because they don't come up together. So there is a bit of a literature, but relating it again to concrete <laughs> current situation, the paper in New York Review of Books is talking about the election over here, Donald Trump and India, Modi, 
uh, that is by Amartya Sen and Eric Maskin, but the work remains past because reality always is so much more complex than what you do in your models. We have to stop now, and Professor Basu will be signing his books in the lobby. Thanks, everyone, for coming out, and thanks very much to Professor Basu.